Welcome to this week's episode of Zero to a Million, brought to you by Unstack. I'm your host, Zach Rigo. Today, I'm joined by Ori Zohar, co-founder of Burlap and Barrel, the first comprehensive single origin spice company in the United States. Ori, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, really good to be here. So we, uh, I'm excited to get into your background. I think it's a, a unique journey. Um, take me to how we got here today and, and some of the experiences you know throughout your career. Yeah, so Burlap and Barrel is a single origin spice company. We just actually turned five this month in October of 2021, which is really Congrats. exciting to cross that. Um, but before then, you know, I've had a, a long history as an entrepreneur. I think the more you can start businesses, the more you like it's a muscle you exercise, you become a better and better entrepreneur with each one. And so even straight out of college, I had a bunch of projects where I would buy caps and gowns from graduating seniors because you're never going to wear your regalia again. And I would get them dry cleaned and sold to the next uh, group of graduates. And so I've always had all these various projects. Um, but then back in 2010, my good friend Ethan had been working at a few restaurants and we decided to start uh, an ice cream cart together. And so we started a, a kind of activist ice cream cart together. We pushed it around the streets of New York City and we got our first experience with building a social enterprise. I'm sure everybody sells ice cream, but how do we have one with an interesting story and interesting flavors and a connection to a larger impact? And after doing that for a summer and getting three cavities, my dentist was very unhappy with me. Um, Ethan had moved to London to get his master's in international development and then to Afghanistan as an aid worker and started bringing back all kinds of food and goodies and all kinds of stuff like that. And his chef friends were losing their minds from the wild cumin that he had brought back from Afghanistan. And that was the first kind of inkling that there maybe is an opportunity for a spice business. Um, in the meantime, I had moved to San Francisco. I'd wanted to do my next startup. I talked to some investors that were down to finance a mortgage company. And so I started a mortgage company called Sindio which is all around creating a more transparent and helpful mortgage broker. We'd be your person. We, we wouldn't get paid based on loan size, but on customer satisfaction. And then we would work really closely with you to help find you the right mortgage because nobody knows what APR is and what points are and all that stuff. So we tried to create a kind of friendly, transparent player in that. And that was my like VC backed experience. We raised $32 million, had over hundred employees, were burning cash left and right. A really classic Silicon Valley story. And ultimately, our Series C fell apart. The investors were tricking us. They were waiting for us to be bankrupt, and we ended up selling the company for less money than we had raised, but still a good enough exit. And um, and then I kind of moved on to the next thing. And that's what brought me all the way back to Burlap and Barrel, where Ethan, who had been in Afghanistan, got his master's in international development, brought back Cuban, came back to San Francisco and said, Hey, Ori, is there a business here? You know, it looks like the chefs are really excited about these spices. And what we saw is that people know where their coffee and tea and chocolate comes from. We know where our wine comes from. We go to the farmer's market and have fresh produce from the farm and meat and eggs and all that. But people don't know what spices are and where they come from. They don't know that cinnamon is tree bark or that peppercorns grow in bunches on vines like grapes. And so I ran the numbers and we looked at it and we decided that would be our next business. And so here we are, Burlap and Barrel, single origin spices. We're a social enterprise. We work to get farmers set up to be their own direct exporters. We're able to pay them a lot more and they get a much larger slice of the pie. And we get really fresh, really high quality spices that are really close to harvest. So that's been our business in a nutshell. And with the pandemic, it's been a really crazy transition, but I'm happy to dig more into that uh, whenever you want to. So so was Ethan uh, bringing back the product often? Like, or was this a one time, like, hey, he brought it back, he gave some, or was this something where he was kind of on the side, like, hey, people are continue to ask me for this over and over again. You know, it was just for fun. And just like whenever, you know, we all travel, like what do you bring back when you go to travel? You bring back little foods and little snacks and things like that. So he was bringing you back nuts and dried fruit and also some spices. And and his chef buddies tried the cumin. And they were like, oh my God, I've never had cumin like this before. We would buy it from you. And so that kind of started saying, hey, maybe there's an opportunity of chefs who have access to all the best ingredients in the world are getting this excited about the spices then maybe there's an opportunity also not just for more chefs and more spices, but also it means that home cooks haven't tried something like this before. And so we started working on the plan and seeing what does it take to import spices and what does it look like? And we registered Ethan's living room as a spice processing facility. <laughs> we did all this stuff to just try to get things up and running. But that was really our first insight was around seeing that people that were professional cooks and professionals in the food world were getting this excited about some spices that he'd carried in his bags. 
And from there, the task of saying, okay, well, if these foragers in northern Afghanistan are getting something really cool, who else is doing this? And so we met a cooperative in Zanzibar that was growing black peppercorns and cinnamon and vanilla and all kinds of things like that. Um, we met a farmer in Guatemala that was growing cardamom and lime and allspice and chilies. And all of a sudden, we started filling out this network and be like, oh, there's a business here. We can actually make something of this. And so it really ended up developing organically in that way. And we're totally bootstrapped. And so we, we've really um, had to find a way to grow the business within our own means. And so that's another. It was challenging. But honestly, I'm really glad that we did it because it forced us to be profitable. And it forced uh -huh. us to only do things that we could make money on. And and is that a a little bit of a learning experience from your previous startup? Yeah, yeah, totally. I think so <laughs> often, like companies that are venture backed, um, making money is something that you do in the future. <laughs> being being wrong, something, and maybe you're right, and maybe you're wrong. And and I think that's a really tough, like existential risk for the business. We had limited resources, and that forced us to focus on how to do things and how do we make money doing things today, and be able to keep growing, keeping able to pay our farmers, keep paying them up front keep kind of getting bigger and bigger purchases. And you know what? At the beginning, it meant it was cheaper to jump on a flight and fly over there and check two bags full of spices under the plane than it was to hire a freight forwarder and do all these things. And so we were scrappy and we were lean. And that's something that we've kind of taken forward with us. And it's been really important to, to helping us build our business. I love that. So you mentioned a couple other industries, uh, coffee and chocolate, I think were two, and wine. Do you feel like there was one, and I feel like this is more apparent in coffee recently with a lot of these kind of like, you know, local shops that are sourcing the coffee and they've got, you know, the trash cans filled with the beans right there and they're they're grinding it. Do you feel like there was an industry that you guys looked to and were like, wow, like people know where this is coming from and they're starting to become, I don't want to say obsessed, but interested in the sourcing of of the the coffee beans, let's say. And that, that leads to some market education that maybe we can use. Uh, you kind of mentioned that, so I'm interested to dig in. There. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I think we always know that like behavior change is the hardest thing to do. It's harder to say, you do things this way now, come with us and we're going to show a totally different way of, of buying. Come online, do this and that. And so right. it's really hard. But what we saw is that like, people knew where the rest of their kitchen was from. And so basically what ended up happening is like I opened my fridge and I have produce from the farmer's market and I got meat from a local butcher. And I know we're at co coffee and tea for two decades have been doing the hard work of telling people that origin matters and yeah. supply chain matters and the farmer matters. And so we were just able to say, hey, you believe all of this around the rest of your kitchen and the rest of your pantry? Well, it's actually true for spices too. And, and, and let us show you why. And so that ended up being a, a bit of a more intuitive thing. If you already believe this, then, then extending those beliefs to spices was a much smaller jump than trying to be like, hey, you know, trying to convince somebody from scratch to, to do this. And so that's what we kind of yeah. leaned into really hard. And that was also something that we saw during the pandemic because once, let's say we got you to agree that our spices are a lot better and that the main spices in your, in your grocery store are already dated and have lived their best years. They're already behind the spices by the time they get to your grocery store. Um, we now needed to, to say, well, come online and check out our site. We're going to have 45 spices. We're going to have a much broader selection but you're not going to be able to just dis decide that you want our spices, drive to your grocery store and then have them for that same evening. You're going to place an order. We're going to ship it same day. We're going to get it to you, but it's still going to be a few days until you have it. And when the pandemic hit, we used to be primarily restaurants. 50% of our revenue came from restaurants leading into March of 2020. And then by the end of that month, it was 0%. And so we had a real existential crisis of figuring out like, what do we have and can we keep going and can we keep the business up? And by the end of May, home cooks had more than replaced the, the, wow. the business we lost from restaurants. And then by the end of the year, we ended up growing four or five X, which was really crazy and unexpected. So we went from like trying to figure out what we need to keep surviving to scrambling to get more things into stock as quickly as possible. And the main reason for that was because we already had a really good e-commerce platform. People already knew our site. It worked well. We had lots of reviews. We had good photography. We had a bunch of press that had written about us. And what ended up changing is the pandemic broke people's regular behavior of going to their grocery store because grocery was out or nobody wanted to step foot. People started Googling best spices, best cinnamon, mm -hmm. best bay leaves, all that stuff. And we were right there ready for them. And so we were ready to take all that interest. And, and that's how the behavior changed really quickly. And the pandemic ended up being from a really scary time for us from, from like existential risk to the business to us really just trying to drink from the fire hose and and make sure we can get as many orders out the door as possible while people were still interested in it. 
What was direct response on Google and, and using paid ads the channel there? I mean, obviously, you know, Facebook, you're kind of you, you can't get that person in the buying moment. So I imagine Google and Bing were kind of the two places y'all had a lot of success. Do you know what? We've spent very, very little money on acquisition. And this is, again, being a right. bootstrap company. We didn't have these big budgets so we could spend a bunch of money on Facebook and Google and figure out what happens. And, you know, spending so many of these uh, direct consumer companies end up spending 50 or 100 percent of the revenue in acquisition. And you can make that work, assuming that a company that you can be profitable in the second or third or fourth order of the customer. And we didn't have that luxury. So we did what we could do for free. And what we could do for free is we would we were pitching press all day long. Journalists writing about food, we'd send them spices, we talked to them, we'd figure all that stuff out. We had done some affiliate, which basically means that that affiliate was somebody would write about us, and when they purchased, they would get some percentage of our revenue. And so we were able to work with affiliates, and that was easy because we didn't have to pay for ads and maybe they worked, maybe they didn't work. We were only going to pay somebody when somebody actually ended up placing an order on our site. Um, and then we spent a lot of time writing newsletters and launching new things and bringing our existing customers, bringing them back again and again and again. And so it was really this much more scrappy thing. And one of the other fun things was partnerships. So we would try to find companies that use spices in their products and get them to make an almond butter with our spices or make a honey with our spices or make any of these various things. And we'd bring it onto our site, but we'd also be in front of their audience. And so that was kind of our scrappy ways of just getting in front of an audience. And believe me, if you buy heirloom beans online or you buy honey online, then we're going to have a much easier time convincing you to also come to our website for, for much, much better spices. And so that's how we kind of got it off the ground during the, during the pandemic and leading up to it. I love that. I think, you know, a couple of things I saw when I was looking at the site and kind of going through the, the products, there's obviously the, the product collaborations, there are cookbooks, you have recipes, you've got playlists, uh, you've got a community. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that, that I think one education piece. So you've got kind of a whole learn section of your site, which you don't always see on an e-commerce site, but there's tons of content there, recipes, et cetera. And then you have a community, which is a, a community for people to engage and talk about spices. Was that something that evolved over the last, you know, 18, 24 months? Or, or was that always a part of the brand and the education uh, as you were building out the company? Yeah, early on, everybody asks us for recipes. And I think content is such a valuable thing and, and not enough brands. Like people people will care about your product, but if they like your product, they'll care about how it's made and to give them a sneak peek into the, the factory, the producers, the growers, the team. Like the more you can kind of like open that up. I think a lot of companies end up trying to, to behave like big corporate companies to like pretend that they have that kind of legitimacy. But instead, your strength is being small and scrappy and having the founder email customers and having the founder post in the forum and write newsletters and all that stuff, I think ends up being a really powerful connection that, that you can't feel with Unilever or Nabisco or you know, any of these massive companies. And so for us, even early on, we tried to find fun resources. So we wanted to make as much content as possible, but content is expensive and we don't have a bunch of camera equipment and video editing, so we don't know how to do that. So what we realized is that we do have a bunch of customers that are super knowledgeable. So we made a spice forum on Facebook and just invited as many people to join as we could. We put in all of our newsletters, we put it on our site, we put in our email signatures. We just kept letting people know that this forum exists. And in the first year, it was just me posting on it and my co-founder posting on it and our team posting on it, just to try to like show people how we wanted to share, like either just showing off something that you made that's like a cool way to use the spices or asking a question or doing a survey or commenting on other people's posts. And at the beginning, it was nobody there. It was just kind of crickets. I would post and then nothing would happen. But when we hit about a thousand members, all of a sudden we had three or four people that were these like more heavy duty, like super influencers that they wanted to post. They were posting every day. They were sharing these incredible meals. They were such talented cooks. It was really impressive to see it all. But we just said, listen, we can't write so many recipes, but we have this amazing untapped audience who is constantly cooking and constantly making recipes and constantly finding recipes and sharing tips. And why don't we use them to be the kind of hub of our community? And so the Spice Forum ended up being an awesome resource for people to go to and get all the information they want about spices and spice mm -hmm. racks and how to cook and how to bake and how people are storing and all the questions you could ask. There were always 10 or 20 people that were willing to kind of think about it and share a really cool answer to it. And so that's where we kind of leaned into the power of our community to create content rather than having to create it all ourselves, which we didn't have the budget or the time or the skills to do ourselves. 
So now there's 6,300 members. How the heck did we grow? I mean, is it is it word of mouth? I, I'd love to hear that scale is is quite large. And I've tried to build a community at Unstack, and we've got a Slack community, you know, seven eight hundred members, which in a year I feel pretty good about. But to get that to get yeah. another zero to that is challenging. Yeah, you know what? We just made it easy so that pe- we just really shared. Maybe this is one of our resources. So anytime somebody signs up for a newsletter, places their first order, anything like that, we send them a, like, "Welcome to the community." You want to listen to our cooking playlist, have some tunes from international artists while you cook? Here that is. You have questions or want tips or want to share? Here's our forum. We just are constantly making these resources really available. And so just like we did the same thing with our newsletter list. We would just write newsletters out when we had 500 people on our email list. And now we have over 80,000. And so, but we always just did the practice of writing a captivating content of, of talking to people kind of eye to eye across the table. And we just got better at it over time. And people kept coming in and in and in. And so we haven't done any crazy hacks or anything like that. We just kept growing the business. And by virtue of the business growing, we just kept stumbling across more and more people that wanted to be part of it. And one of the cool things is that the bigger the communities are, the more valuable they become. And so like, as we were able to do it, we were able to talk to members, we were able to feature them. We've been asking members for recipes. And now we've been building out our recipe section with Spice for our member recipes. And we're now starting to work on a cookbook of, of uh, recipes from our Spice 4 members. So we just tried to oh, find wow. fun ways to engage it. And one of the really fun things about this is that people started bringing in their friends too. Because we created this funny community online that's one, super positive, And two, is all these people, their families are so tired of them talking about spices and cooking. And they found this community of other people that want nothing other than talking about spices and cooking. And so it's been really nice to see how people have kind of found each other and found other people that have the same passion and same interest. And so then they invited all their other friends and it became kind of this hub for conversation around spices and became a kind of like broader service. So most of the people know our business, have our spices, have tried them and all that, but it's not a prerequisite to getting value out of this community. So is the community now, you mentioned early on you were seeding content because you had to, if not, it would just be a blank wall on the internet. Uh, now it's a lot of user generated content. Is there any other marketing involved there? Obviously, I imagine when you say, Hey, we're going to feature recipes from our community, you know, in a cookbook, people then get excited. They're creating videos. They're putting the content out, but any other marketing that's going into it on your end to try to get more engagement or more scale there? Yeah. You know what? It's been, I think the really big part of it, I, we think about it in kind of three phases. Phase one is getting people that don't know about us to know about us, right? The awareness. And a lot of that is through press and journalists. And that's less than, we're not sending out press releases. We're meeting food journalists. We're talking to them. We're sending Google alerts. We're trying to be useful and helpful about the origin of spices, which nobody knows anything about and highlighting our farmers. And it's so much less about our business and so much more about where this comes from in an education thing. This is the middle one is make sure we have high conversion rate on the website. So we're constantly doing things saying, okay, you got to the website. Can you find what you need? Is the free shipping rate really easy to get to? Do we have a bunch of collections that make it easy for you to get on the site, add to cart and check out and get free shipping? Is the search bar working really well? We now have more than 50 spices. Is it easy to navigate the website and find what you're looking for? So we're constantly doing all these little things and there's no silver bullet, but everything like makes makes conversion a little bit better, helps people find a little bit better. And we always ask people to, to email us and we try to do as much as possible to reach out to people even very often, if it's your first order, we'll email you, not an automated email, a personal email. I was just saying, hey, I'm Ori, I'm the co-founder. Thanks so much for placing your first order. How do you find about us? How can we help you with something? And like, what ends up happening is this is not scalable, purely qualitative, not quantitative, but we find out that there are things that are broken on the site or somebody says, I wish you carried this, or I was trying to find this and I got stuck. And they give us all this information on whether they're stumbling And just one way that that's helped our business is somebody, we got like three or four people say, I want one of every spice. And we said, really? Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah. So we made the complete collection, which is literally one of every single spice that we have. At this point, it's over $400. I said, nobody's going to want this. This is, it's too rich. Who wants that? And people have been sending it for housewarmings, for wedding presents, uh, for birthday presents, for, or just to just kind of be the, do this above and beyond thing. And last year we did more than a hundred thousand dollars of revenue just from our complete collection alone, which was really surprising <laughs> and unexpected, crazy. but it all came out of listening to our customers and they asked for this. And so we, we just got a chance to do it for them. So really that's all about lowering the bar for somebody to reach out to us. 
And the third phase is all about saying, hey, and not enough people do this, but it's so much easier to get an existing customer who's already placed an order to place their next order. And it's because they know you, they've taken a risk. Hopefully they like your product. And so a lot of this stuff is around sending out newsletters, is about reaching out to customers, is around making cooking guides, is around finding new and fun, interesting things on the website. And so how do we make the site? It's like, we're not like Whole Foods. Like we don't have limited shelf space. We can launch 50 products tomorrow if we wanted to, and we could take them away. So we have all these like limited release, collaboration, co-branded products. We're launching a spice grinder and an apron and a this and a that just to have lots of fun things so that going to our site really feels like you're going to this specialty spice experience, that the website is fully built for it. It has all these fun things. You're going to stumble across something new every single time you go. And so a lot of that's been about re-engaging. And so when we grew 5X in 2020, half of that came from new customers, but half of that came from existing customers, just replacing so much more of their pantry with our spices. And so too many people are always thinking about where is my next new customer, where I think that you should spend a lot more time focusing on like, who are my customers today? How do I make their day? How do I add extra goodies to their orders when they place their second or third order? How do I send a personal email from my team, from the founder, from whatever? Like, how do we just make it magical so they go from being a one-off purchase to a repeat purchase? And then you're going to see them again and again and again. And that's where the rubber hits the road. So you mentioned a few things there. Uh, product launches, collaborations. Are Who's in charge of the new spice mixtures? Is that coming from a partner is that ethan still i'd be really interested in like you know hey we got a black lime and we've got a wild mountain cumin and we've got you know other sort of mashups or collaborations how are those partnerships or or you know new products sourced yeah i think so ethan is my co-founder and he's in charge of sourcing and he's in charge of kind of like the cooking and culinary side of things and i'm in charge of the business and operations side of things and that's how we kind of split the world the fun thing, we both have both of our kind of lists. Ethan loves these like esoteric spices and has his own list of things that we want to be able to knock out. Oftentimes, it's his chefs that are asking us for these because we, we sell to chefs, we sell to grocery stores, we sell to food makers. And so often chefs are, are really awesome resources for saying, what, what do you wish we had? Um, and then we have a bunch of, on my end, I'm not, like I'm a more casual cook. I like to cook with things, but, but I can get overwhelmed. And so the, I, I want to just make sure that we're covered on our basics and on people that, that are like, what about garlic powder? What about onion powder? And we're also going to lean into next year a lot more blends because we learned that it turns out that McCormick's best-selling spice is not peppercorns, is not cinnamon. It's Montreal steak and chicken adobo. Yes. <laughs> and so people just love spice blends that they just, they're already mixed in the right proportion. You can just sprinkle it on food and it'll be delicious. And so we're starting to develop our blend, blend lineup now that we have all these single origin spices, the next step is to start mixing them together so that our customers have these really easy to use blends. And so it's always a collaborative conversation, but making sure we have really cool new stuff that people have never come across. And we're the only people that you can get it from in the US, um, but also having really stuff that's easy and intuitive. And you're like, listen, I love chili peppers. You're like, great. Let's get you a full variety of chili peppers that'll just blow your mind. And, and I think that that'll really be fun and interesting and different. And so we're constantly trying to find that kind of balance. And so that we can both have the high end cooks and the casual cooks. Everybody can find what they need and, and, and get to it pretty easily on our website. Love it. What are you most excited about in the business and kind of the go to market strategy for the next 12 months? So obviously you've had an amazing run in 2020, obviously changed the business slightly. And I'm sure 2021 you've, you've kind of harnessed and refined the, the, you know, D to C strategy as opposed to the, the other direct to chef strategy, which is also D to C. Um, but talk me through yeah. what you're most excited about and, and, you know, from a business and marketing perspective, you know, something from a business perspective that's been fun is that we used to, we used to barely be able to hit the minimums for like everything that we needed. Our partner farmers would laugh at us when we would come by and ask them for 25 kilograms of cardamom or whatever, because we were their smallest customer by like two zeros, you know? Um, and now what's really cool is that we're buying farmers entire harvest and we're their main customers. And like our partner farmer, our partner farmer in India, Dr. Salunke, who we buy our turmeric from, we used to be, again, the smallest customer of his. And now we're not only buying everything he grows, but he's training some of the neighbors on how to grow it. And because he grows wow. regeneratively and organically, it's actually really cool. He's taking other farmers that traditionally sold non-regenerative, non-organic turmeric, and they're seeing that he's really succeeding and growing his business and we're just insatiable. And so he's teaching them how to do that. And so the community is growing. 
And so what's been really fun is we're able to say, we can now put some money behind our mouth. Like we can buy farmers entire harvest. We can prepay them much nicer. We can help them buy grinders and help them find all these ways that at the beginning, this was all a couple of goofy guys coming to their farm and saying, we'll be back. And then, like, yeah, bags. sure you will. <laughs> yeah. And now we're here, we're buying full containers of spices. And so it's a, we're, we're getting to make good on the promise that we made to our farmers five years ago. Uh, we're getting, we're getting to, and that's really been exciting. And one of the other things that we really like is that we used to do collaborations to try to get our name in front of other customers, like products. So we would go to a bigger company and be like, Hey, will you make a salt that, that is blended with our spices? And now what we're able to do is we're able to do collaborations and we're instead able to place really big wholesale orders with our collaborator partner and be their biggest customer and put them on the map for our customers. So instead of us asking other companies to put, to put us in front of their audience, we're putting other smaller companies that we think are really cool and often are immigrant run, run by people of color, just doing different, different kinds of products that don't really get enough of the limelight in the massive grocery stores and trying to put the focus back to them and put them in front of our audience. So that's been really fun to be able to, to kind of have that, that power. And Patagonia has been a really cool model for that. How as soon as they were able to get bigger, they were able to start creating new fabrics, creating new standards for the industry and doing all these things. We're nowhere near that scale, but, but in our own little small world of single origin spices, um, we're, we're able to start kind of, people are starting to pay attention to what we're doing. And it's really cool to be able to kind of throw our weight around in that way. I love it. No, that's a, an amazing story. Last question. My mother-in-law loves cooking. I got to get her a gift for the holidays. What's the go-to package to, to buy? I have no idea. Like I am not, I'm a salt and pepper, you know, spice kind of guy. I love yeah. spices. I'm happy to put them, but I'm not cooking. So I don't know. What's a good little package I can buy that's just the perfect entry package to burlap and barrel for, for my mother-in-law's holiday gift? Yeah. So we have two things there that are fun. One is our fundamentals collection, which is just six spices that, that you will be familiar with. You'll know what to do with. They'll just like slot right easily. They're just better versions of stuff that you probably have in your pantry. And you can take that old stuff and you can compost it. You know, like it's just like that. That's really easy. It's intuitive. And, and I promise that even if you're not cooking, you know, regularly, put this stuff on popcorn, sprinkle it on your chicken, throw it on your fried eggs. All of a sudden your family is going to be like, oh my God, to what do we owe this treat? <laughs> if your mother-in-law is a little bit more adventurous, we have our chef's choice collection, which is our, our choice of six spices that me and my co-founder chose that we think are ones that you maybe haven't come across but you're going to try them and you're going to love them. So like we have sun-dried tomato powder. We have ground bay leaves. And instead of whole bay leaves, just use this as a powder and it's going to be really great. We have a really incredible garlic powder from Northern Vietnam that's so savory and so intense and so delicious. And so we have all these really fun things that, that none of this should be intimidating. All this should feel like you're at play. And, and believe me, you're going to start using, like you're going to be painting with a much broader palette for flavor once you start kind of integrating some of these spices into your cooking. And so if you want to, you just let me know and I'm happy to put together a set for your mother-in-law or even make sure that we get you some spices that you can use in your kitchen. I'm sold. I'm sold. I've already added a couple to cart, the ones that you recommend. So, uh, Ori, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, where can everyone find you, connect with you, or, or more importantly, connect with the brand? Yeah, absolutely. So if any other entrepreneurs, especially food entrepreneurs, especially people running social enterprises want to talk about anything, feel free to reach out to me at ori at burlapandbarrel.com or add me on LinkedIn. I respond to every email that I get. It's, it's too much, but I try to. Um, otherwise, check us out on Burlap and Barrel on Instagram. We just got back from a trip to Hungary where we got to meet our, our partner, Paprika Farmer, and spend a few days on the farm with him. And you can come and just basically explore and see where spices come from, see what the farms look like, see what the people are that are growing them, and see what makes them so special. So check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or join our Spice Forum on Facebook. So you'll be able to find us there. But come check us out, and we'd love to get you some spices. Awesome, Ori. Thanks so much. Oh,